Welcome everyone to Mailfuzz TV, I am Peter and today I'm going to be talking about For All Mankind Season 1, the first four episodes in particular. And this is a show that I saw the first episode of, I reviewed it with Connor way back when Apple TV launched. And I was always intrigued by the premise, I was always intrigued by this alternate history. I, I like the, the show creator Ronald D. Moore who did Battlestar Galactica, so I was always interested in the show. I don't know if we had too many shows going at the time or whatever else, but we only reviewed the first one and moved on. Um, but I was always interested in going back. I'd heard people talk, talking positively about season two and three, so it seemed like a good time to go back and check it out and see and actually discover what the show was beyond the first episode. Because I think one of the few things I remembered about checking out episode one a few years ago was that I didn't necessarily necessarily feel like I got a sense of what the show was going to be episode to episode. Like, it introduced the premise, it introduced the idea that the Soviets got to the moon first, and some of the first things that happened as a result of that. What's interesting is that having now watched the first four episodes, and I guess spoilers for the first four episodes of For All Mankind, so I can talk about them freely here, is I think had I watched another couple, if I'd watched up to episode three probably, I'd have been way more invested. Uh, because I think the end of episode 2 kind of lights the spark. Because the reveal at the end of episode 2 is that the Soviets then land the first woman on the moon. Right? Because, you know, episode 1, the Soviets land on the moon, and then it's like, oh shit, let's get Apollo 11 up there, let's go do this as quickly as we can. And by the end of episode 2, they've done that, but then the Soviets one up them and have the first woman on the moon. And this was, like, immediately kind of fascinating there was like you know watching the reactions of the various female characters on the show in that moment and then taking that into episode three and the fallout of that and how those reactions develop as new developments arise to me is where the show kind of comes to life because immediately you're giving me this alternate world science fiction of how would the competition if you because know, effectively the space race cooled down once the u.s won it it cooled down and it didn't have the same drive that it did before to win. And what this show is effectively doing is saying, well, if the Soviets kept staying one step ahead, what would have motivated uh, out of everyone else, particularly the US, but like, what things would have advanced maybe quicker than they did otherwise because people are kind of put into a position where they feel they need to do it. So the idea of seeing the Soviets land a woman on the moon and then immediately Nixon's like, oh, we need to do it now too. We need to start training uh, women astronauts. And kind of the pushback to some of that, the difficulties with sort of rushing it along, uh, but generally just seeing the reactions of, of the various women in the show to the initial landing and then the announcement they're going to be you know, training astronauts and then the announcement that one of our main characters is going to be one of those astronauts, or at least in training anyway. So all of those moments is where I really started to feel the show kind of like become something it was like okay i get what this is doing now all of a sudden we're examining this alternate version of progress but it's not necessarily coming from a good place you know it's you know nixon doesn't say let's put a woman on the moon because he he wants to for any other reason than to because the soviets already did it is this not some noble gesture or idea or uh you know some sort of brand of feminism it's not that at all from his sake but it doesn't change the fact that, you know, women around the world and little girls around the world are watching this and being inspired by it. And, you know, it does its own version of, like, protests and stuff in the show, and we, we kind of see some of the reaction of this stuff. Um, but to me, that's where the show became... I was like, okay, I'm kind of excited now. I kind of get what this is doing. And I think episode three is probably my favourite of the four episodes that uh, we've had so far, partly because it felt so focused, because it was so much about... Uh, the the potential astronauts the uh, uh, the ass cans they were calling them um, and they sort of set up Tracy you know her character because you know Gordo's one of the the astronauts one of the main astronauts and then Tracy's his wife and so at the start of episode three you find out that she used to be a pilot as well and then she kind of gave that up to become the the you know the the, the mother of the kids and and the housewife and all that stuff and it kind of set up oh she's got this history. And there's a little bit of stuff with them in the first couple of episodes. You know, we get the sense that he does cheat on her when he's away for, for work, and she kind of hears that and is ready to leave him, but is talked out of it. Uh, from Karen, who's the other main astronaut's wife, uh, that's Ed, played by Joel Kinnaman, 
uh, Karen, like, that's uh, Patty from The Flash, and she's Butcher's wife on, on The Boys. Like, I've seen her face a bunch of stuff. And just recently was reminded she was in the fourth Final Destination movie, of of all things. So, anyway, so, so, these are the, all, all, so we get interested in the characters, but, like, episode three is where she really becomes a main character, is where she really becomes important to the show. And we're interested in all these other women who are candidates in this program, some of whom, at least so far, having watched four episodes, feel like main characters. Uh, one of them, of course, does die at the end of episode three, and it's like, okay, we don't really know who is safe long term. At least, I don't, because I have no idea who's listed as, a, as like a series regular, who's a guest star. I don't actually know, which is kind of nice. It's, it's kind of, it makes it a bit more exciting that I don't know who the, who, which characters are going to develop into main roles and which ones are going to leave. Um, but obviously there's other social issues at play, you know, one of the, the candidates is a black woman, so that's obviously something that uh, is mentioned. They also say that she was also already working at NASA, and that kind of, you know, uh, if you saw Hidden Figures, which was a movie about uh, some of the uh, the black women who were working as, you know, quote-unquote computers, they called them at the time, uh, and how it was kind of ignored in history, and that's what that movie was kind of about, and this is kind of acknowledging that and bringing that in. And so... What is why things really kill this? Obviously, it's addressing these issues and it's playing with this idea of how circumstances can lead to certain advancements out of necessity, even if the world's not ready for them. I think examining the reactions of some of the characters to some of this stuff is my favorite part of the show so far. Maybe my one of my favorite scenes of the entire thing is a scene in episode three where it's Karen and Edward having dinner. They're sitting at the couch and they've got these little TV trays out and it's right after they've announced, or it's earlier in the episode they've announced that there's going to be women astronauts and they're going to be trained. And there's going to be 20 candidates and all this stuff. And Karen does not like this. Karen feels this is making a mockery of what her husband does and she gets very uptight about it and she's like, you know, ranting about it. And I think what's int- what I love about this scene is that it kind of subverts the expectations where... You think that Ed, being this, you know, white dude in the 60s, is going to have a very problematic attitude, potentially, to this. That he's going to be upset about it, that he's going to say something sexist, he's going to do whatever. And what's interesting is, he kind of says that he's not necessarily sure if it's a good idea, but he otherwise actually acts very reasonable. He just says, no, I'm just focusing on what I'm doing, I'm going up in Apollo 50, I'm just going to keep focused, and... You know, he's not making a big hoopla out of it. He's, you know, whatever. It's, he just kind of sits there. And it's a scene that's kind of played for comedy because Karen keeps, like, taking his foot away, you know, towards the end of the scene. And he like, he, he doesn't understand why she's upset. But he's not upset. She is. And I thought this was a, a really funny scene, but it was also a really good little character piece because it gave us that he's not quick to judge to an extent anyway obviously in episode four he has some problems when he actually has to work with uh one of the women on his mission and gordo's taking off his his flight but in this scene he acts fairly reasonably especially given the time period and she's the one who's upset and saying this is a mockery that this shouldn't be allowed and she's you know annoyed that this is being fast-tracked and this takes a lot of work and Obviously, if you're reading between the lines here, what you're getting from her is that she feels a little insecure that all of a sudden these other women are are being given this opportunity and it's maybe making her feel uh, insecure about her life and about the choices she's made and that, you know, she's like, this idea that if these other women can do this, then what the hell was she doing up until now? What choices has she made that's led her to this? Um, it's, you know, she's kind of like almost... Uh, projecting onto her husband that he should be angry because if they can all do this then why isn't she and she feels bad about that she fe- she feels regretful perhaps and uh, you know th- that that little bit of a twist to to how this scene plays out um and sort of looking at this from these perspectives and this from you know a traditional 1960s into the 1970s housewife and how she is having trouble accepting that other women are getting to do things that she maybe never even dreamed of. Um, and then you've got, you know, the complete flip end of that where you've got this little girl, this immigrant who loves NASA and space and, you know, is dreaming of it the entire time. I, I don't know how far in time we're going to move along in the series. It's going quite quickly. We, we've already moved like a year by episode four, I think. 
So I don't know if we're going to get to the point where this 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 teen girl is going to grow up and be an astronaut or or something. But um, you know, right. But that's the thing. Like as much as end of the end of episode two is the spark that kind of ignites the real like drive of this this examination of male and female roles in this system and how progression is is restrained or sped up depending on these other factors that really have nothing to do with the progression itself but they just kind of uh, lead to it is thematically there is a lot of things in the first two episodes that once you got to that point you look back and you think about what it was doing and you think about how much it spent time on how karen was reacting to her husband's job and role or how much time tracy was reacting to gordo's role as an astronaut um, and then it's paid off once all this stuff starts going. Uh, the, the obvious example is in episode four when Tracy's away for the launch of Apollo 15. She's not on the, the mission, but she's there to help out. And it's Gordo who has to stay home with the kids. He can't handle that. And he says, wait, shouldn't we talk about this before you go off on trips like this? And she hits him with, well, we never talked about it when you were told you had to go on trips. That You, you just said you had to go. That was your job. Now it's my job. And the hypocrisy is kind of hi- highlighted and he doesn't really have a good comeback for that. Because Gardo otherwise has been kind of okay with reacting to things um, up until that point. He was kind of bribed with giving a, a good seat on Apollo 15 before it was taken away from him. So there was a bit of an incentive for him to just be okay with it. Um, but that's a great little moment. And the, the, the extension of that is when she is there in, in, uh, in Florida she flushes the toilet, she intentionally runs away when she's on the phone to him to flush the toilet because in episode one or episode two she heard a toilet flush when he was away and it let her know that he was you know he was with someone else and she's not actually with anyone else when she's away she's just doing this to to mess with them and almost to make it clear that she knows and to make it clear you know don't push it because she is aware of these things and this hypocrisy is not going to get them very far so um, it's challenging a lot of things with these characters, and you, you do see other characters. The guy who's there to represent the president, he's always saying things. Um, you know, the, the big other thematic thing early on, like right from episode one, uh, Margot, who's the uh, oh, I can't remember her job role for the life of me, but she, she's doing all the math and she's in mission control and stuff. Um, but there's a big deal in episode one and two of her getting that position to be the first woman in mission control, and looking back on it after you know we get to all the stuff where oh we're actually going to put a woman in space we're going to do the, make a woman an astronaut all of a sudden like oh that was thematically just you know t- you know teeing all this stuff up that that was just like sort of the 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 tip of the iceberg and now we're really getting to the meat of all of these things and then once you actually get to the woman you've got the cynicism of the older woman molly who's got the most experience as being a pilot who is convinced it's all going to get cancelled before it gets anywhere uh, and then you've got the other ones who are brought in for various reasons, you know, and that's the thing, Tracy gets a lot of flack because she's the attractive housewife of one of the astronauts. So and the president's made it clear he wants an attractive blonde to be, you know, the the, the, the American woman who's on space, you know, on the moon uh, for the visual of it. You know, uh, they, they try and argue against Molly because she's a bit older and she's a bit, as they put it, rough around the edges. So you get all this like casual sexism coming out when they're talking about these things and um you know deke actually and you know chris bauer who plays deke i'm so used to him playing kind of like entertaining but like kind of scumbags like you know if i I think of his character on the wire or even to an extent in the deuce like he's got a very uh scumbaggy kind of mentality in those shows so it's kind of interesting to see him in a role here where he's yeah he's very you know you know tough on you know other characters and stuff like that but he is kind of a straight shooter, and when it comes down to these little moments where someone is like sexist about something, you know, he'll be like, "What? Well, that, that's nothing to do with going to space." Like, I, you know, I train pilots, I, you know, I train astronauts, I put them in space because they're they're fit to be in space. I don't give a shit about this. And he has probably probably the most heartwarming moment of the the first four episodes, in episode four, where the president has decided that because the Vietnam War is coming to an end. That that's the good, you know, that's that's the good uh, publicity, publicity. So they, they can kind of just forget the the whole female astronaut thing. But Deke basically makes this choice because he was once upon a time cut from the Mercury missions and and the space race. He just says, "No, uh, they've worked hard for this. They are they're pretty much ready. I'm going to make them astronauts." And he does a whole press conference 
without uh being you know with, without notifying the president and the people and he just kind of does it and then they can't go back on it because it's all over the, the news and stuff um and it's, you know it's, it's kind of this sweet selfless moment where and i think what i really like about it is no one knows well i mean obviously the asshole who works for the president knows because uh, they didn't approve it but none of the none of the the ladies know that he did this you know n- none of the other characters who it would mean something to find out that he made this choice and put his own job on the line because as, as you know episode four ends with nixon saying if she screws up on this mission this is this is on you that you know you're going to get cut down for it so it's very selfless and it makes them very likable and it you get these different attitudes from from different characters uh, throughout relating to these themes particularly sexism obviously some other things do crop in from time to time and uh, there's discussion about how some of the men in the bar feel threatened that they're there there's uh conflict when molly's actually training with ed and the other guy in episode four uh until finally they share a joke just as they're about to launch uh or is that actually as they're launching in episode four but they finally kind of laugh with each other and it feels like finally there's some sort of camaraderie coming along um but, you know, there's some entertaining sequences, you know, when they first uh, get together f- for, for drinks and dinner to get, you know, to get to know each other when she's been put on the mission. Like, Ed can't shut up about giving advice and whatnot. And she kind of says, hey, I was test, I was doing, uh, you know, test pilot jobs, like, when you were still kids. Like, technically that gives me seniority. Um, and they just look, like, mortified that she is maybe claiming to kind of be in charge. She isn't really. Ed's the commander, and Ed's been in space before, so obviously he is. But the fact that they even feel, like, threatened and sort of put aback by that comment and her just cracking that joke um, is enough to sort of show that, yeah, like, there's waves being made here. (laughs) Like, there's an uncomfortable vibe because there's change. And that's a word that's brought up a couple of times in the show so far, is the idea of change. Um, So... All that stuff is is really fascinating and seeing how the different characters deal with it and kind of address it. Uh, you know, obviously there's some other social ideas that are brought into it. I mentioned, um, you know, race coming into it a little bit. And you know, there's not too much of it as of yet, but obviously there's a little bit of awkwardness when she's the only black woman in the classroom, when they all first show up and stuff like that. Um, the idea of sexuality has also been brought up uh, a, a bit as well um one character and i'm not quite under the names yet ellen uh she turns out to be gay and you think she's flirting with the other guy who works there whose name i cannot remember for the life of me but it turns out that uh, they're just friends and he's kind of already clocked that she's gay and he kind of makes it clear when, when he has to go pick her up and cover for her because she was at some you know i think it's the bartender's place uh, the scene was kind of dark i think it was the bartender she was with but he makes it clear that, hey, if they find out about this, like, you will never fly. You will never be, you, you will be scrutinized, one for lying, but then also, of course, just the general um, bigotry of the time period and stuff. And he has a little line where he says, trust me, I know, uh, which kind of implies that he's also gay. Um, so he was never actually, you know, f- flirting or upset that she she was into, like someone else anyway. This was always something different. Uh, and she's kind of denying it for most of the scene, but then she kind of like tears up a little bit and accepts the advice. And when they walk in at the end, they're holding hands to kind of sell this illusion that they are a couple. When in fact, it's you know far from the the truth. Um, so yeah, they're they're hitting on these 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 different things, and much like how there's this like accelerated progression by having a woman astronaut like right after Apollo Eleven, and all these things moving forward and changing and challenging the time period uh, and accelerating stuff, it does make me wonder if some of these other social issues are going to also be accelerated in some way. Like, uh, d- does something happen that... that ch- I mean, I don't know. Like, I, I don't think the Soviets... I mean, the Soviets t- traditionally pretty homophobic, uh, I think, from what I, from what I can remember. So I don't think they'll be announcing to put the first gay person on the moon. I don't think that's going to be happening, but... That is, you know, like, will that be accelerated as well because of now this different path in, in history and how certain things come out of necessity? It's kind of like, um, uh, you know, World War II, if I remember correctly, or was it World War One? I? I think it was World War Two. Yeah, it was World War Two, uh, where in the UK specifically, because all the men were going away to fight and they were being conscripted, 
Um, a lot of women took up the roles that the men had before. They took up the jobs in the factories and the, you know, all the other jobs that were seen as traditionally masculine because they needed to still happen, but all the, you know, most of the men were away. And that did a lot for, for feminism because, you know, when the, the men came back, all of a sudden it's like, well, no, why can't we still keep doing jobs like this? Like, we're skilled enough to do it. Why not? And, you know, that, that pushed things forward a bit, right? And I think this is sort of taking that idea and doing it in this sort of what-if scenario and seeing how differently the timeline could play out. The other big thing, though, to get away from social topics uh, is how much more accelerated and advanced would space travel become if there was more of a drive to keep the race going. Um, And it's like episode two of this show, I think, or maybe episode three, the idea of putting a base on the moon is like brought up and they think the Soviets are trying to do it. And they find the ice on the moon, which we know about, and sort of talk about how they can use that and stuff. But they're racing to put a base on the moon, and that is not something that's ever happened. So already they're going, they're they're aiming further than real life ever got, uh, at least up until now. And there's even like a comment of like, well, that's that's our you know our refueling station. If we set up a base on the moon, we can refuel and then get to Mars. And it's like, holy shit. And I don't know much about the, the the future seasons, but I have seen the poster for season three, and it does look like there's going to be some Mars stuff in it. So this idea that that is also going to keep advancing in a way that never happened, uh, and just uh, again, a, a great what if. But what's so what's so good about all this is that it's not just doing it for the, the oh, this is fun to say what if this and what if that. It's more about how it still reflects and comments on on real life. It's still you know, by, by analysing how these things have changed here and how this, this, you know, this space race and this drive is already altering kind of um, the push for feminism and where that's going. Um, you know, you see a lot of signs in the show saying a woman's place is in space, and which is, you know, some nice catchy, you know, phrase. Um, but you, you've got all this, this going, but it, it's, not, it's not like it's just a... A fun little joint in an alternate reality like all of this is still a commentary on the real world all of this is still relevant to to real world social issues and politics and feminism uh, all of it still applies and it's an examination of again like how these different characters react to certain things you've got the housewife who almost is uh rejecting it because it's making her like question her own choices uh, but you've got other characters who are cynical and don't believe anything will happen. You've got other characters who are dreamers and think it can. Um, and then the variety of the men on the show who are all acting very differently to things. Some who are outright opposed to it. You know, the, the, that, that asshole who works for the president actually, you know, basically t- talks down to Margot at one point and tells her, who are you? When she offers to give a, you know, a solid scientific reason why they can't just pick any random spot in the moon for a base he is affronted that a woman there suggests something to him. And one of the other guys has to say, no, she works here, this is her job, and she's got a goddamn point. You know, like, there's this kind of uh, thing. That's the other thing that I, th- I saw creeping in in episode four, because episode three is my favourite, because it's got a lot of set pieces, it's got the, the, you know, all the tests, the one in the desert, you know, that shows Tracy's got a lot of heart, because she, she refuses to leave the other woman behind. I, th- I think it was Ellen who got her foot hurt. Um... And the various other tests that they're doing throughout the episode. It was a really solid, well put together episode. But episode four did introduce a couple other things that I thought were really interesting. It had some of the, the, the Tracy Gordo moments that I thought were some of the best in the show. But I also really appreciated, again, these ideas that are creeping in. Um, like, so Margot, for instance, like, she, she suffers this, like, put down from this guy, she, you know, that works for the president, who dismisses her opinion. And then we see that she's working, you know, maybe twice as hard, three times as hard as everyone else. She's constantly working away. But we find out that eventually she does have one thing she does for relaxation. She goes to like a like a jazz bar or whatever it is, and she plays piano. And it's this idea, you know, we see her sort of like uh, thinking about it when she's working on the math, uh, you know, at NASA. But then she goes to this this jazz bar and she's playing piano. She's totally lost in it. And Molly, the older, you know, the, the, the oldest character of the female astronauts who's been selected for Apollo 15, she happens to be there with her husband, who, who we've just been introduced to as an audience, and says, oh, hey, I, I guess I finally, f- you know, discovered something about you, Margot, that I like. Because up until now, Margot's been very, you know, serious with her. You got to 
be better. You can't be failing these tests. You can't be failing these simulations. You know, she's been very like harsh on her. And maybe that's also kind of this, uh, you know, product of like all of these women feel like they have to work twice as hard to prove that they belong. Um, because if they make any mistakes, they'll be like, well, see, we told you, like, you know, women shouldn't be here. So they, they feel, they feel this extra pressure. So they're, they're, you know, Margot's being twice as stern than she probably should be. Uh, but what I liked about this is this idea that she, um, keeps this separate from everything. And she even asked Molly not to tell anyone at work that she does this. She doesn't want other astronauts or anyone who works at NASA coming here and seeing this. This has to be completely separate. She needs an escape from that. Um, and I, I think as an exploration of not only like the struggles that some of these characters are facing and proving themselves and being these pioneers, the idea that, of having like this relief where they can sort of forget that they're doing it. And because Molly as well has this great line actually before, uh, it's when she's arguing with Margot, I think actually uh, a little bit later in the episode, she says, I'm not some role model for girls. I'm just a pilot. Um, you know, she's not accepted this role because she believes in being this role model, but she can't help that she is. You know, when the launch is happening, we see t-shirts with her face on it and all this other stuff. And it's, it's all very, like, you know, it's all very heartwarming and inspiring. And, you know, the, the teen girl, of course, has traveled to watch the launch and she, she's in awe of the whole thing. Um, th that idea of, like, taking these roles without really necessarily accepting or understanding or even comprehending the the the, the wider meaning of it because molly's definitely a character who's not going into this like oh i want to be the first woman in space and that's been my dream and this is a big deal for womankind and all that you know she's very straight she's very to the point uh, she's very jaded she's all these things and this extra pressure of being the first to do it uh, you know, she's constantly dropping references to feeling unjustified. In fact, what, that's one of the, the lines that leads to the laugh uh, with the, the crew members when they're launching at the end of episode four is that, like, all of the ceremony to see her off is, is stupid because she's not done anything yet. Yeah, she's going to be the first woman on the moon from the US, but, like, she's not done it yet. <laughs> but they're all treating her like a rock star. And, you know, that makes her a little uncomfortable. And I, I think... That's one of the other interesting explorations of these characters that I really like is um, they just want to do the thing they're there to do. They're not necessarily there to be the pioneers and to get this attention. And um, I mean, some of them might be and might, might go in with that thinking, but for the most part, they just want to be good at what they do. Uh, they have this hunger to just do the thing that they're, they're, they're supposed to do. Uh, and we see that with Tracy as well, who's constantly conflicted that you know, she's questioning, is she just there for the wrong reasons? Is she there because it's just a, a publicity stunt? Uh, but she has this this drive and push to do it. And at one point, she goes to Deke, and Deke says, I think you should drop out. And she's like, I'm not going to drop out, so you're going to have to boot me, because I think I want this. Um, and she does good in some tests, she does quite poorly in others, but uh, you know, this constant question of worth, and this constant question of uh, how difficult it is for these women, and especially, you know, some of the, you know, if they happen to be gay, if they happen to be a person of color, just how much all this compiles and how much effort this is taking, which is, which is why it's, it's, it's a very relieving when you see some of the male characters not act like dicks. But even when some of them do inadvertently act like dicks, there's kind of some nuance to it. You know, they're not all just blatantly raging sexist morons. Um, like some of it is meant from kind of a, a not a kind place per se, but you know, like the, the 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 dinner with Ed, where he's kind of overcompensating and and kind of giving advice and saying, just you know, follow my lead and you'll be fine. Like it is a bit douchebaggy, but it's also not. I don't think it's completely mean spirited either. And there's a great comparison where later that night she's having uh molly's having a nice night with her husband in the bath whereas he's just having this he's just complaining because how she was at the dinner the whole time and him and karen are just kind of lying in bed kind of awkwardly and you know not having a nice night and how this has gotten to him but it's not really gotten to her bizarrely um and how, how the change may actually upset the you know the, 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 it's actually had more of a, a an emotional effect on him this interaction that it has on her, I guess, is the point I'm making. Um, and just sort of seeing those uh, play out uh, as it kind of keeps challenging and keeps showing these different stages of this 
this journey as these norms are being altered. And the show's already went quite far in four episodes. When, when it started training astronauts in episode three, I thought, oh, well, this will be the next five episodes. And it was one episode. That was <laughs> that was the whole thing. <laughs> we had the big dramatic death at the end of the episode, which was which which was well done. Uh, but uh, and you know, I've said all this stuff, and I've barely even mentioned like you know, episode two had von Braun, who was like you know the big guy at NASA who was an ex Nazi, and they, they they revealed all this in court to discount his opinion and get rid of him, and you know it was all very dramatic and it was well done, but it feels like a million miles ago. Now, after episode four, it was only two episodes ago, but it feels ancient because, you know, he's been gone since, basically. Um, and maybe he'll pop back up. I don't know. I have no idea. Um, but uh, actually, one of the interesting things is at the end of episode three, there was a moment where. Uh, sorry, a moment, episode, sorry, end of episode four, uh, there was a, a dedication card at the end is what I'm trying to get to. Uh where it credited, or not credited, but it, it it gave, you know, in memory of or dedicated to um, the character that Molly seems to be based on. And that's something that I never even considered as I was watching this, is that some of these characters, uh, who are obviously doing things that the real people never did, are, are based somewhat on real people who either worked at NASA, you know, the sort of characters who should have been considered at the time but weren't because, because it wasn't the norm. Um... It feels like there's a lot of background history that could probably complement a lot of this that it'd be quite interesting to find out about, um, and how it kind of, you know, where they're pulling some of these names from and characters. Um, as far as critiques go, uh, like, I was kind of gobsmacked when they said the launch of Apollo 15 was about to happen in episode 4, because I'm like, wait, when did, uh, 12 through 14 happen? Uh, it, feel, it feels like they barely mentioned that those were, were going on. And what's funny is I thought to myself, oh, I guess Apollo 13 went off without a hitch then, because obviously, famously, Apollo 13 didn't go so well. <laughs> so, uh, no, but uh, I am digging the show. I, I'm very much digging its, uh, how do I put it? I, I'm digging its exploration of, of social norms. Oh, that's not quite right. I mean... <sighs> Basically, the way he's using his alternate history to kind of examine how social issues would be affected if the establishment or the powers that be were motivated to do things differently because the space race kept going is fascinating. It's what's good about science fiction is you can kind of just alter a few things and all of a sudden you're examining what hasn't happened in the real world by showing what happens when it did happen in your fictional story. Uh, or vice versa, or a mix of both, or or whatever it may be, um, and I I have really enjoyed uh the show, particularly episodes three and four. I think are just so rich with ideas and just good little character beats. Where you know, I mean, that's the other thing that that scene I mentioned with the uh, dinner with uh Karen being upset and Ed just be, being confused as to why she's so upset because he's oblivious to to what she's actually thinking is that that's actually the moment where I kind of liked him for the first time. Up until that point, you know, he had that whole plot in the first two episodes where he opened his big mouth and got them, in, you know, NASA into trouble and all the rest of it. You know, he, he did come across as a little bit of a whiny bitch <laughs> for the first two episodes, but that moment made him more likable. Because one, because he, he didn't act too sexist, which is kind of something you may have expected him to, but also just how, you know, it felt kind of relatable that he's just not getting why she's upset. And yeah, we can get it as the audience because uh, you know maybe we have more information than he does. We can see between the the, the lines a little bit better than he does. But um, you know, shockingly, comparing like their marriage to the marriage of Gordo and Tracy, and then comparing that to Molly's marriage and any other relationships, so far has enriched the characters because it's kind of pointed out their differences and how they're each reacting to these different, you know, big developments or personal things in different ways and we're getting this nice range between them all and being able to compare and contrast them is making them all stronger characters so i guess what i'm trying to say is that the show is fairly well written uh having gotten to episode four i feel i feel like it's doing a lot of smart things um so yeah uh, i'm enjoying for all mankind i am looking forward to watching the rest of season one and going into the the other seasons um 
I might do something in between seasons one and two, and then two and three, like this, you know, this is obviously my kind of like catching up slot. I did Yellow Jackets like this, uh, season one, and I did um, Severance, or I finished off Severance like this at least. And, you know, now I'm going to do it for All Mankind, where I'm going to do three or four episodes uh, per video and just kind of talk, you know, update my thoughts on the season where I am and uh, talk about what we're doing with some of the some of the stories up to that point and whatnot. Um, so yeah, so expect two more videos on season one of For All Mankind, pro a five to seven video and then a, a eight to ten video because there's ten episodes per season. Um, I might go and do another season of something else and then come back for season two, or I might just keep going. Uh, if season one ends really well, I, there's a good chance I'll just be too like invested to, to, to pause and do something else. I may just want to keep going. Uh, but... Uh, hopefully people are into me going back and checking this show out and getting some of my my you know all over the place thoughts as i as i tend to <laughs> as i tend to ramble on but uh very very i think it's a, a really smart science fiction show and it's funny because it's obviously science fiction because it's alternate history and it seems like it's going to get more science fiction and the actual space race stuff as it keeps going further like beyond kind of like what real life has has had but it's also science fiction just in the raw sense that science fiction is about using a fictional story and or, or more, more precisely a fictional uh like premise or, or device to examine people right that, that's that's the thing you know whenever you watch a show where like you know one alien race or even the human race is being big, bigoted towards an alien race of some kind it's just talking about racism. It's using an alien to do it as an allegory, but it's still just talking about racism, you know. So here you're you're using this alternate history to kind of explore these like different paths, and all of it is is still super relevant. I mean, that's why they're making the show, obviously. But uh, you know that, that that's what makes it all click and what makes it all work. Um, and the fact that the characters are kind of growing on me as we're going further in. And we're getting a bit more of them. Maybe the the fault of episode one, especially, and maybe to an extent episode two, is that there's so many characters and you're sort of darting around that you're not necessarily sure who's going to be the main characters yet. I think by three or four, it's kind of found its footing. It's honed in on what's what's really cool about the show and what's really unique about it. But it's also given all these characters finally time to really shine and become sympathetic and even when they're doing something wrong or they're having the wrong reaction to something, they're a bit more layered than just being one note. So you can see Karen, for example, reacting poorly to the fact that the the, the women are good up in space missions and she's kind of like giving deep shit about it when she, when she sees them. She's complaining about it a lot. But then at the end of episode four, when she's standing next to Molly's husband and they start holding hands because they're both scared about their spouses going up, it's kind of sweet and it's kind of like, oh, she's still a human being. She, you know, she, she's acting out in a way uh, to try and make herself feel better or trying to understand how she feels about it. You know, maybe she's not even sure herself yet. In fact, I'm almost inclined to think that. She's still a human being and it's, it's not coming from necessarily a place of malice, but she has to sort through her feelings to get there. Um, So, good stuff. Uh, for all mankind, I'll be back uh, in about a week. Uh, with my episodes 5 through 7 thoughts. Uh, so uh, don't spoil anything past episode 4. Not only for myself, but for anyone who is uh, watching along with me and is keeping up with my pace. Whether it's now or in the future, you, you, you can just uh, use these videos as a, as a, as a breakup for the actual show. But uh, you know, keep it spoiler free for future episodes down below. Uh, but yeah, do comment uh, on the first four episodes and uh, like, subscribe, ding the bell. You can, of course, uh, hit the super thanks button if you want to support the channel and all the content and keep it all coming. You can also, of course, support us consistently over at patreon.com slash TV and get some bonuses for your trouble. Uh, but otherwise, that is me. So thank you very much once again for watching or listening. I always appreciate it. Keep watching TV. Have you got any vanilla?